everybody. I'm so psyched to share with you Dr. Sharon Stills. She's going to be reviewing the tenets of biological, bioregulatory medicine, how that is different from functional medicine, what types of assessments are done, how the philosophy is different than others, and why we get the results we do in a bioregulatory approach. She's going to talk about assessments that are different. She's going to talk about testing. You don't want to miss this one. I know you're curious about how the body really works. That's why you're here. And Sharon Stills, the Red Hot Medical has it for you. Join us. Welcome back to the Beats with Kelly Kennedy from Our Heart to Yours. And I have a big heart here for this lovely woman, Dr. Sharon Stills, naturopathic doctor, extraordinaire, who I've known for a couple decades, but have really gotten to know very well over the last couple years. And Dr. Stills is here because she is educating us about how the body really works, which is what we're all about. And she has she's had a clinic for many years in New York. She's now in Arizona. She does a lot of telemedicine um, in helping people with blood work. And we're going to dive in today to really get everybody to understand what's the difference between bio bioregulatory medicine and functional medicine. So the red hot medical as she and completely embodies. I want to introduce you all to my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Sharon Stills. Hi everyone. It's awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. We are so happy to have you. And, and one of the reasons that um, Sharon and I have connected throughout the years is because when we go to clinics and we go to seminars, Sharon's always teaching. She's always one of the teachers that everybody wants to have uh, educate others. And one of the things she teaches the most is um, that I've seen anyway is about meditation, about mindfulness, about how to really be and not just do. And she's one of the most um, compliant clients. She really walks her walk and talks her talk. And so how did you get involved in naturopathic medicine and bioregulatory medicine? Let's start there. Oh gosh, that's, that's a big question. Uh, just briefly, I mean, I guess, you know, we all, a lot of us at least have our own story. We have a family member. And so for me, it was my own personal story. I grew up very sick. I had severe asthma, severe allergies, I was overweight. I was, you know, my pediatrician had an office named after me. It was like exam room one was like, well, my last name was Levy then was like the Sharon Levy room. So that's how often I was there. And that's, you know, you want to be good friends with people, but not necessarily your pediatrician that you're seeing so often. And so, you know, I was just in the medical merry-go-round and, you know, in the hospital, in oxygen tents, getting, you know, shots all the time on tons of antibiotics, you know, while I was going up to the corner and eating Big Macs and drinking chocolate shakes at McDonald's, you know, because there wasn't the connection there. And so when I was pregnant with my first son, I was concerned, you know, I didn't want to have a, a sick baby like I had been sick and my illness had progressed into addiction. And, you know, I just, I just like to cover it all. So I, you know, had lots of issues growing up and found myself, you know, pregnant at the age of 20. And so I, had a friend who was actually a colon hydrotherapist and into holistic medicine. So that was kind of like my first introduction and very into nutrition. And I just thought, you know, this makes a lot of sense. And I can remember being pregnant and back, you know, we're talking about 1989, which is 30 years ago. It's a long time. And I can remember I was living in Buffalo, New York at the time and sitting Wegmans was like the most natural. I don't even know. Are you from, is that where you're from? No, I'm from Long Island. Oh, okay. I thought you were from Long Island. Okay, anyway, that's my stomping ground. That's for what I was like, what? Okay, I don't even ahead. know, like, did Whole Foods, I don't even think Whole Foods existed back then. No, I don't think so. It was fresh fields, <laughs> but anyway. So I was, Wegmans, I grew up with Wegmans. I know Wegmans. So I was in their little mini, you know, organic section, like sitting on the floor. I was literally sitting on the floor going like, what's healthy here? What can I do for my baby? And then when I got divorced um, a couple of years later, I had two small children and I was like, what am I going to do with my life? I was like, I had heard across the border that there was this like really cool doctor who used ozone and did natural things. And I thought, I want to go check him out. And I went there and I remember walking out at the parking lot and just saying, I'm going to do that. And I didn't even know that you had to like go to undergraduate school. You know, I had no, I was just like, I'm going to do that. And I really 
believe in the power of the spoken word and I just kept saying, I'm gonna be a naturopathic doctor. I'm gonna be like him. This is what I'm gonna do. And I got it together and 10 years later, I became a naturopathic doctor. And so it was really initially, I wanted to help um, other parents because my son had issues with his ears and I had to learn about like not to vaccinate him and not to give him dairy and how to give him healthy things and how to feed him. And I spent so much time figuring it out on my own, I thought, you know, I want to help other parents. Like not everyone's got this time or this drive or this interest. And wouldn't it just be nice if I could just be a wheelhouse of information and knowledge for them. And so I did finally go through naturopathic school and focused on pediatrics and psychiatrics. And when I graduated and opened up my clinic, my seventh patient in the door was a pancreatic cancer patient. Mm. And I was like, Ooh, I have never, I had never even seen a cancer patient. Somehow I had made it through medical school and not seen any cancer patients because I was so focused. And I just kind of took a deep breath and said, okay, there's this man here who needs me. He's been told he's going to die. And I was very honest and said, I've never seen a cancer patient before, but I have a philosophy of how the body works, of how the body regulates itself. And I'm willing to apply that to you. I make no guarantees because this is new ground for me, but I'm willing to do what I can and help. And so I did that and he ended up not dying from pancreatic cancer and living another 10 years and dying from an unrelated cause. And it was a huge lesson to me as like a brand new doctor out of school that like, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. We're so attached to our diagnosis, but it's really about the person. It's really about regulation. It's about the extracellular space. It's about the thoughts we think and our mental and emotional status. And you can apply that to any disease process. That is beautiful wisdom right there from this wonderful woman who, believe it or not, is a grandmother from that son that she's talking about, just had a child like six months ago or so. Seven months, and that son I'm talking about just graduated from naturopathic medical school. So we've got oh. another Dr. Stills in the house now. <laughs> That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank and you. that is a beautiful wisdom. I just want to go back to that you, you saw this person that came in with a diagnosis you had not dealt with, but you knew the principles you had learned, the philosophy of which of how the body works, if you applied it. And what is that philosophy? That the innate intelligence heals, correct? That's your that's your philosophy. Am I wrong? It is. And you know, but the body needs help. And so like if you are in a disease process, so of course, I was just working on my newsletter for the week and I was just quoting Ben Franklin, you know, about an ounce of prevention. So, you know, it's always easier to prevent. But if we just start to look at the body and see where is it out of balance. And, you know, so there are many different things we need to look at. Is there toxicity in the extracellular matrix? Is there toxicity in the cells? Is there a dehydration process going on? Is the pH too acidic where it should be alkaline or too alkaline where it should be acidic? Because I think there's a misconception we all know, like get alkaline, but there are actually parts of the body like the stomach and the vagina that actually should be acidic. That means they're healthy. And so knowing how to balance the body in specific places so that the pH is proper, making sure the lymph is flowing, making sure, you know, I do a lot of work with the emotions because a lot of times you could be chugging all the green juice and doing your yoga and getting your acupuncture and sleeping at night. But if you're harboring anger or grief or trauma, that's going to get in the way and block your healing. And so it's really, um, you know, there's so many different things that we have to look at and it's different for everyone. And so if you, you know, a big thing that's different about how we look at the body is like, if we're talking about a diagnosis, so there are like common threads in a diagnosis, say, so like, you know, maybe someone who has migraines, we're going to look at food sensitivities or hormones or B vitamin deficiency, but it might not be all those things for everyone. So someone seeing a doctor like me, you know, if they brought six of their friends all with the same diagnosis and then they hung out in the waiting room and looked at their treatment plans, they would, they might have some common threads, but they'd all be different. Right. And that's because everyone is unique and there's reason that they got the symptoms, which have maybe turned into a diagnosis is just signs post, right? Because 
for the people that are just watching this, you know, this is new information for them, let's say regulation and the concepts of regulation, like we're, we're talking about it like it's common, but can you explain in your terms what regulation means? What yes. that term means? So regulation is how the body is regulating. So like if we're sailing along, we call it homeostasis. So everything is just like status quo. And then there's a stress that comes to the body. And so you have an infection, let's say you have a bronchitis. So there's inflammation in the lungs. So the body has to adapt. And so the body is going to secrete blood cells and cytokines to help deal with the inflammation and that's an adaptation that's the body's innate wisdom that knows how to heal and it's going to help to regenerate now a problem is if it doesn't then come back to the status quo if the inflammation is excessive and doesn't know how to be turned off then you're not adapting you're not regenerating you're stuck you're not regulating so it's kind of like you know if you hit your hand you go ouch and then you like have pain, but you should be able to come back to not in pain. But if we can't regulate properly, we're either going to stay stuck in ouch forever, or we're going to even drop below our baseline. It's like the pain is going to take in, has taken so much out of us that now we're not at our regular homeostasis. It's kind of dropped down a little. And now our baseline of health is now lowered. And so it's really important that the body can regulate, it can adapt, it could heal, regenerate, and ultimately that we are self-healing. You know, if you cut your finger, you kind of clean it out and put a Band-Aid on it and you don't really think about it, the body does the rest. And the body has that capability in all parts of our body, in all arenas, and we just need to get out of the way. So get the toxins out of the way, get the metabolism that's not working out of the way, get the bad food out of the way, get the stressful lifestyle out of the way. If we can clear these things out, the body's like, yippee, you know, now I can go to work and do what I need to do. And so I think in regulatory medicine, because functional, maybe some of you watching have heard of functional medicine and functional medicine is like a great thing. It's like, the traditional doctors going, okay, this idea of just having a symptom and giving a pharmaceutical is very limited. Let's, you know, let's see what we can do that's more natural. And so they are, they're doing better testing, they're using nutrients, they're, they're looking at toxicity. So they're, it's definitely a step in the right direction, but they're missing the whole extracellular space, they're missing the whole lymphatic system, they're missing a lot of the mind body and the connections, they're missing energy medicine, the fact that biophotons and through light can communicate in cells in the body. So they're missing the whole resonance. And that is that to me, that is, you know, they're missing the idea of pleomorphism, that organisms live within us, and that it's when our host goes out of balance when our pH is off, when we're stressed, when the lymph is congested, when we're demineralized, that these organisms, these bacteria that live within us that are symbiotic, that are helpful, go through a life cycle and become pathogenic. So for example, like strep throat. So we have streptococcus living in our throat. It's symbiotic. But when we're stressed out, it then goes through this life cycle and then it becomes bacteria and pathogenic and it becomes painful. And that's when we have an issue. And so, you know, when we think about the times now of um, COVID-19, and I was just having a conversation um, with a family member who was like, everyone needs to get a vaccine and, you know, going off and, you know, she's like, you're going to get a vaccine, aren't you? And I was like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, well, what would you possibly do if you're not going to get a vaccine? And I was like, uh, what I'm doing right now, strengthening my terrain, taking care of my immune system, taking care of my body so that the virus, you know, if it comes to me, it's going to be like, ugh, this is like a low grade hotel. You know, I don't want to stay here. I'm going to look for a five star hotel that, you know, in a five star hotel in this case is, you know, a terrain that is toxic and not healthy. It's kind of, you know, inverse because I'd prefer a five-star hotel. <laughs> but, you know, when you take good care of yourself, organisms don't want to reside like, there. Yeah. yeah, you know, and I, I always think about, like, you know, I saw in my clinic for a decade very sick people, you know. I mean, I had kids cough in my eye, you know, just like things, you know, pneumonia, really sick people, acutely ill, the flu. And why was I able to see them and, you know, be in their face and examine them and not get sick? 
And then other times, you know, I would know, like if I was having a rough week or something was stressful was going on in my life or hadn't stressed, I'd be more nervous to like see sick people because I knew my terrain was more susceptible. Otherwise, you know, if the germ theory is really all we're operating on, you know, I would have gotten sick every time I saw someone and I can tell you I didn't. So what you have just exemplified is I, God bless you and thank you so much. This is exactly the point I want people to understand. Germ theory is what Western medicine is based on, that a germ outside makes us sick, right? And what we're talking about is the terrain, because I think people don't understand this extracellular matrix, and we're not here to make you chemists or biologists or anything, but it is important for us to know how our body works. We are born with this, and we don't have an operating manual, and we're trying to give you the operating manual. And through this podcast, and actually Dr. Sills is starting a podcast through BRMI, which is Bioregulatory Medicine Institute. It's a nonprofit, non-commercial website that's designed to educate you with empirical-based evidence to know how the body really works. And talking about this pleomorphic concept of science that in Europe is a very common understanding and in America has not been yet embraced, but we know y'all are helping us embrace it because it's logical, it makes sense because we have three times as much lymph as we do blood. And I don't think people understand that. There is three times as much fluid in our body that's called lymphatic fluid that besides just the red blood cells and the white blood cells. So the blood part is one third, the lymph part is well, one fourth and the blood parts three fourths. So you have a hole. But that space between the cells, that milieu, that terrain is another word Dr. Stills used, is the environment in which those cells live. And if that environment is conducive, these non pathogenic, non making us sick streptococcus that we have naturally occurring in our mouth, when the environment is just conducive, maybe additional stress maybe additional exposures to toxins, maybe it's additional chemical stress for some reason. Now that can morph and change and become, its life cycle can increase it to a pathogenic streptococcus that's now gonna cause illness, perhaps in our throat or tonsils. And so actually, actually when we're, we're treating it, we're not really eradicating the bacteria, we're just down-regulating it from being pathogenic, causing disease, to just being symbiotic again in your body and living harmoniously with you. And so, you know, there, there is, I mean, obviously, and we can see what's going on out there, like people are catching COVID, but they're catching it because they're not taking care of their bodies and they're like looking to the outside for, you know, like why aren't we talking about like ways to fight COVID, like eating a healthy diet, getting enough sleep, right? You know, getting your vitamin D and your glutathione, making sure your lymph and your detoxing, you know, no one's speaking about that except for people like us. And so I'm not in fear because I'm taking care of myself. So, you know, I know that the germ doesn't want to live here. And if it did come, it wouldn't stay long and it wouldn't be an issue because my terrain is strong. And so it really puts the power into you. I think, you know, through the years, you know, the doctor has always been on this pedestal. And now I'm like, I'm not on a pedestal. I'm like right next to you. You know, I have some knowledge. I'm going to share it with you. And hopefully you're going to integrate it and embrace it and do it in your life. Um, but, you know, it's really about empowering you because you live with you 24 seven and you're the one who makes the choices and the choices you make from, you know, are you going to drink a Coca-Cola or are you going to drink some filtered water? Are you going to go to sleep at 1 a.m. in the morning or are you going to go to sleep at 10 p.m.? Are you going to go for a walk or are you going to sit in front of the TV? Like all these lifestyle choices that we make contribute to how our body regulates. And because the body has to adapt for each one of those things, right? Yeah, I mean, there, you know, being alive is stressful. So yeah. you mentioned, you know, you know, I love to teach meditation and it's not about avoiding stress because I think that'll happen when you die and, you know, we're all looking at <laughs> exactly. long lives. So stress is part of the game. It's part of being human. It's how you respond rather than reacting. It's how you, and so it's the same in your body and your physiological processes, you know, how can you respond if you have a chemical that comes in, is your immune system ready, able, and willing, or is it distracted because it's off chasing 
foods that you're eating that are causing immune reactions because you're eating the wrong foods or drinking too much alcohol or whatever it is that you're doing. And so we have stresses, you know, we have physical stresses. It can be in your structure and your spine. We have, we all have chemical stresses. I mean, the environment has just turned into a toxic place. It's, it's sad. And every time I go to like an environmental uh, medical conference, you know, I just walk out of there like super depressed because we're just, <laughs> You know, there's just, I mean, you know, even babies like in the umbilical cord and in the mother's milk, you know, there's like thousands, I forget the exact number, but toxic chemicals that they're just exposed to right off the bat. So it's no longer a question of like, well, am I toxic? It's like, how toxic am I? Because I know I'm somewhat toxic and how am I getting rid of it? Are my detoxification pathways working? And so like, you know, moving your lymph system. Like I'm a huge, like sweating, I think is like everyone needs to sweat. It's a great way to cleanse and get toxins out. And so it should be part of everyone's, you know, daily event where you're getting a good sweat on. And, you know, is your glutathione, are your glutathione levels at the right level so that your liver is working and you are processing and you know does phase two and phase three is your biliary system working because that helps with detoxification are you pooping every day you know sometimes i have patients come in and they're like well yeah i, I go to the bathroom regularly and i'm like oh how regular i go once a week you know and i'm like oh. <laughs> and so you know like we should, you know, optimally, like every time a baby nurses, a baby poops because it's like food in, garbage out. So like in, a, in an optimal thing, you know, if you're eating three meals a day, you should be pooping three times a day, which very few people do. So, you know, at a very minimum, you need to be having a nice bowel movement at least once a day, optimally twice a day. And so these are just things that we don't talk about. You know, if you're not going to see someone like you or me, no one's, no one even mentions your lymphatic system, which just you know, totally blows my mind. The only time it's mentioned really in allopathic medicine is like if you have cancer yeah. and they want to- Or to your, your plastic surgeon. The plastic <laughs> surgeons know about the lymphatics as well. And they're usually the ones reconstructing the breast after the cancer and then they know about the lymph. Right. But yeah, it's, it's really, it's something. And so just to spin this a little bit. So let's say somebody's coming to a doctor like you and they want to you know, they've been to functional doctors, they've looked at the function of their liver, they're looking at the function of their guts, they're looking at function. What would make your approach different in a testing way? Because we don't, we, we don't just rely on our, our minds, right? We do quantitative assessments. W what kind of testing do you do and how does that differentiate from allopathic blood work testing and that kind of thing? I mean, I kind of know the answer, so I'm leading her y'all. I really know the answer, but I want y'all to know the answer. So, and I do do extensive blood work and, you know, and like 30 tubes, extensive blood work. Cause she really wants to know what's going on and she's vampire blood work, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's different. So first I'm running a ton more levels in the blood than you, you know, when you go for a typical physical, you get like a complete blood count, a comprehensive metabolic profile and you get a lipid panel and then you get this false sense of oh i'm healthy and i'll see you in a year and that's like reading like the first page of like a 500 page novel it, it's so superficial and i you know it concerns me because it gives people this false sense of i'm healthy when really they haven't even been evaluated properly then within the blood work you know there's re like like for example the vitamin d the range is 20 to 100. So you're telling me if you're 21, you're normal. And if you're hundred, you're normal. And so there's always optimal ranges. Like I like to see patients vitamin D levels around 80 or 90. I like to see them nice and high, give them good protection. And so you need to really look at optimal levels. But beyond that, some of the testing I do, which is looking at the regulation of the body. So I do heart rate variability, which is looking at the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And most people are stuck in the sympathetic nervous system. Their sympathetic nervous system is overworking. So think fight, flight, or freeze, you know, which worked really well when we were prehistoric saber-toothed tiger, you know, being chased by a saber-toothed tiger and we need to get the heck out of there. But now that saber-toothed tiger is the red light. It's the kid's teacher calling. It's the inbox of emails that's at 20,000. It's the deadline. It's the pile of bills. It's, you know, it's just, it's just life. We have created a life where we're like overscheduled and overstressed. And so we're always, you know, we live by an alarm clock and we don't really value 
self-care. And so one of my missions in life is to really, you know, make self-care a priority and, you know, schedule it on your calendar. And I have become the queen of self-care and it, you know, I have a great parasympathetic nervous system because I allow myself to rest and relax. So I do heart rate variability testing. And I also do um, CRT, which is computerized regulation thermography. And that's one of my favorite tools. Uh, it's a machine that comes from Germany and what it's doing. So some of you have probably heard of thermography as like um, an a picture, alternative, a, a photo. Photo, which yeah. is an infrared photo. So you get a picture of your breasts and they have you like put your hands in cold water and then they take another picture and you can see like red and inflammation and you can tell if there's an, in, um, an issue there. Whereas the regulation thermography that we use is actually an infrared wand that is taking temperature readings all over your entire body. So there's a cutaneous reflex from the internal organs that actually goes to the skin. So you can take a reading on the skin and see how an organ is regulating itself. And so you do these points and it's a very sensitive test. The patient has to prepare and no shower and no, you know, there's lots of- Very rules. German tests, very precise. <laughs> um, but the nice thing is it's reproducible, you know, it really is, so it's really not- right. And so, and then after the points are taken, the patient then stands for 10 minutes in their underwear in a temperature controlled room between 68 and 72 degrees. And then you come back in and you retake the points. And so it allows you to see that 10, minutes of standing in your underwear in the cold is a stress to the autonomic nervous system. And so you can see how the body responds. How it adapts, right? Is it able to regulate itself? And temperature is the most sensitive thing in the body. So that's going to show stuff before blood changes, right? Because oftentimes I know you probably find the same thing, like their thyroid is cold and cooling, which it should be warm and warming but it's cold and cooling. But if you look at their blood labs, even if you're looking at free T3, free T4, and um, the antibodies, that might all look fine. But regulation isn't fine, meaning that if we don't do something about it, somewhere down the line, there's going to be a problem. Exactly. I, I always call it like my naturopathic treasure chest, <laughs> you know, or treasure map. And it's kind of like, you know, yes, you might not see something because, you know, a really good example of that is like the liver enzymes in the blood. So like people get their liver enzymes and their BUN run and their creatinine run for their kidneys and it looks fine. And but then, you know, I do a thermography and their liver is blocked or hyporegulating or paradoxical. It's regulating the wrong way. And they're like, well, I was told my liver is fine. But like when you're looking in the blood, you know, if there's enzymes spilling into the blood, you're in a pathological state. There's a lot of inflammation. The cells are lysing open and there come the enzymes. And that's what you're seeing raised in the blood. So just like you said, we're able to see things, you know, sometimes eight, 10 years before they're going to happen. And so we can prevent them from ever occurring. And so it's a very wonderful tool. And it's the only tool that I know of that actually measures the lymphatic system. And I'm sure you find the same thing. Like, you know, I've been doing this almost 20 years. And uh, if I see someone who has a lymphatic system that's regulating properly, I'm like, how'd you cheat on the test? You know, like, I just don't believe it. You know, it's kind of the same with like a vitamin D level. Like if you're not supplementing, everyone is deficient in vitamin D. And so when I see someone who's not, they become this like anomaly to me. And so everyone has lymphatic congestion. And so, you know, you can't be healthy without clearing the lymph. And so, you know, we'll do things to move the lymph and then we'll retest and we can see that it is repairing itself, that the body can adapt. You know, the body is a marvelous little, you know, machine we have here. And so all we need to do is feed it what it needs, nurture it, help it reduce what it doesn't need. And it's like, yes, thank you. Now I can function properly. And that's exactly what you've armed yourself with and now others. You know, I think about your story and you felt in fear, right? In fear of being sick your whole life and not wanting to have a child that was sick its whole life. So I'm going to find another way to do this. And not only did you find that way for yourself and your family, but you've educated others. And I think that's why we both sit back during the COVID and we're like, 
great. We got more free time. We got we got space. Clients can't walk in our offices. So we get to, I worked on the podcast. You're getting your podcast up and running. Like I didn't sit back at COVID and go, oh, what happens if I get the virus? I sat back in COVID and go, all right, now it's time for me to get my vitamin C IVs, get my lymph work and make sure I get outside, make sure that my priority is me. And I think I'm healthier than I've ever been during COVID, honestly. And from a perspective the other side that I want people to realize is I've known you for 15 years. That's when I met you 15 years ago, Dr. Rao's first class. And I would definitely say what we do is (laughs) anti-aging, right? Because what we're up against in our life is acids and toxins. And if we are better at getting acids out of our life than they are coming in, then we will naturally heal and we will naturally age appropriately because you are a grandmother. I don't want that to go without you know, significance. And she's a grandmother that decided for lifestyle that she wanted to live closer where this baby was going to be. So she moved cross country to live in an area where she is happier and healthier because she can be outside more, nothing against Manhattan, but she wasn't able to be outside as much as she is now. If you were stuck in Manhattan for the last four months versus being in Arizona for four months, it's a little different environment that she put herself in to ensure that she can go for her hikes. She can go into the water, into the waterfalls and all the dancing and all the great things that she does to make sure she gets her healing. Because the one thing I know about Sharon, when we were traveling or weather, she's like, nope, it's my bedtime. Nope, I'm going to get my massage. Nope, I'm going to the spa. I don't know what you guys are doing. And she's also the first one sitting at the table waiting for everybody to eat the food. Like we're at dinner now. What are you guys waiting for? It's time to nourish ourselves with this amazing food, right? That is true. I'm laughing because that's true. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely a sleep Nazi, but I just know, you know, the things that I need to feel good. And a lot of the things that I need to feel good are just things that all humans need to feel good. And so we do tend to cut into our sleep or not take drinking and hydrating or with water seriously. <clears throat> We're moving our bodies and all these things. And so sometimes healing is, you know, it doesn't have to be so profound. You know, even, you know, and I see a lot of very sick people. I see a lot of cancer people and a lot of people have autoimmune disease and, you know, been around the globe and trying to find help and can find help. And, you know, sometimes it's like basic stuff that we need to do to reverse really severe diseases. So I'm not to say that, you know, there aren't other things we need to do, but it definitely, um, it's kind of like, you know, there's just a lot of common sense that we forget about. It's like we are programmed to want to not take care of ourselves. And, you know, we, I, I don't know why we've created a society where taking care of ourselves is not valued. And I remember like when my kids were little, I, um, they were going to a birthday party and I was like, okay, you know, what are they having? And so like I duplicated, I made like a gluten-free dairy-free cake and I went there and brought the cake and everyone thought I was weird. And I was like, you're all feeding your kids like this artificial chemicals, antifreeze, like, and I'm the weird one. Like, I'm not sure how that, you know, and I think we've come a long way since then. And natural medicine is really, you know, coming more to the forefront and more people are seeking and open-minded. And so I think that's great. And I think, like you said, you know, why we're here sharing this, you know, I've spent the last, I don't know, 25 years of my life studying and I'm still always studying. And a lot of what I find, just like, you know, you know, we find overseas. And so we have to go to Germany or go to Switzerland or go to Budapest or go wherever it is I'm going and bring back these healing techniques because we are really a pharmaceutical driven society. And so it, you know, healthcare is really become pharmaceutical care, which is a gazillion dollar industry. And we're not about that. We're about healthcare and putting the person first and helping you to heal. And, you know, you don't really like to me symptoms are a gift and you wouldn't like have like if a baby's crying you wouldn't like be like shut up or you wouldn't ignore the baby you know you'd be like oh the baby's crying you know is she crying because she 
Is her diaper dirty? Is she hungry? Is she uncomfortable? Is she cold? Is she lonely? So when we have symptoms, it's our body's way of saying, uh, hello, you know, I, I need you to slow down. I need you to pay attention to me. I need you to feed me better. So like if I get a flu or something, and it's funny because, you know, I get sick and it's good to get sick. One of the things I see a lot is that my cancer patients always come in and they're very confused because they're like, I don't understand it. I don't understand why I have cancer. I never get sick. And I'm like, well, that's a problem. You want to talk about regulation. You know, we need to get sick. We need to be able to fight off an illness, to prime our immune system, to respond, react, and regenerate and heal. And so, you know, when I would get sick, patients would always be like, Dr. Stills, you know, I don't understand why you're sick. You know, you're superwoman. I'm like, no, I'm sick because I'm human and it's okay to get sick. But like for me, the first thing I do, like if I get a flu or something or a cold, I just go, okay. I'm going to lie down and I'm going to look at my life because somewhere here I must be doing too much or ignoring something because my body is talking to me and saying you need to slow down and you aren't slowing down on your own. So now I'm going to make you slow down. I'm going to put you in bed for a couple of days. And so, and, and I would say that it's probably a couple of days though, not a week. Like some yeah. other people might find themselves down for the count weeks and not getting recover. Whereas when we get sick and I, and I say that all the time, when we get sick, we go home, we rest, we allow our bodies to heal, then we come back even stronger because now our body has those antibodies that it didn't have before. So that next time that comes along, whatever that was, we can manage it better. And we're not suppressing symptoms. So I'm not using Tylenol to bring a fever on. I'm like, fever, yeah, do your job, you know, and own an innate healing system. So um, you know, we're supporting the body. And yeah, I might go get a vitamin C IV or something like that but we're just giving nutrients, we're not suppressing. And when you think of, you know, another good example I think of is like when a child um, has eczema and so they bring the baby to the doctor and the doctor gives them like corticosteroid creams. Right. And so they put the corticosteroid cream on the rash and then they're like, oh, the eczema is gone. And then two years later, you know, that baby has asthma. <laughs> right. Exactly. It didn't really get rid of it. It just suppressed it into the body. It suppressed the body's ability to handle it. And now it's driven it deeper into the body. And now it's in the lungs and now it's going to show up there. And so our body is really miraculous. Like when we, you know, have issues, there's always this physiological and there's always this emotional component. So like, you know, patients who have sore throats or throat cancer, it's like, well, that's your throat chakra what are you not speaking? What are you keeping inside? Because stagnant energy, stagnant emotions is going to manifest eventually in a physical situation. You know, kids who have ear infections, you know, is there fighting going on in the house? What do they not want to hear? And so every part of the body, you know, has, has a correlation with something emotional. So, you know, not only do I ask myself, like, where am I not taking care of myself physically, but it's like, hmm, you know, if something's going on with my lungs, the lungs are where we hold grief, you know, what am I not grieving? Or if something's, you know, if you're having liver issues, that's where we hold our anger. And so are you holding on to anger and resentment? And so there's so many beautiful ways to look at the body. Um, I think another thing also that is, sets us apart is um, like functional medicine doesn't really have any appreciation for constitutions and, there are different constitutions. So we as people tend, you know, so a common way of looking at that is like in Ayurveda, there's Pitta, which I am, there's Kapha, there's Vata. And so these different constitutions need different treatments for similar issues because they go out of balance in a different way. And so like someone who's Kapha tends to be heavier, they're sluggish. They're kind of like they have these big, beautiful eyes. They're, they're kind of like the mama earth people. You just want to constantly hug them. And Vata is, you know, skinny and they're very airy. And I think everyone in Western society has some kind of Vata derangement because we live such a stressful society. And so in regulation, we really look at constitutions, whether it be from a pleomorphic perspective, are they mucor or the aspergillus and so you kind of get a different idea of how to treat someone it becomes about their constitution about who they are as a human being and they're physically and spiritually and so it makes um treating a lot easier from my perspective <laughs> but it really addresses the individuality we're definitely have going to have to have dr stills back on our show because that brought up genetics 
that brought up all sorts of things that I, hormones that I want you to educate others about because it's really true that when you treat the body well, it will treat you well. And what we forget often is that that huge emotional component that, that there is to health and to regulation because primarily we're emotional beings having physical experience. And Sharon and I are very happy, happy people giving you a little bit of depressing news that we're responsible for our own health and we're responsible for what's going on up here and managing that. But that's also very freeing. You know, it's at first it feels like a huge responsibility. And then after a certain amount of time, you're like, good Lord, what would I do without this responsibility? Because I am my own keeper of my own thoughts and my own heart and my own mind. And I'm in control of that. And if I have control of that, then I control everything else here. And for those that need help, Sharon is available for you. You can find her telemedicine. I know she wants to say something. I'm going to give her the space to do that. Um, <laughs> But you know, we could go on and on because that's the thing. We want you to really understand how your body works. We know that you have questions. We know that this has brought up probably more questions than you have when you started this. And that's really good because you're thinking about how your body works. You're thinking about how it's adapting. You're thinking about what it's trying to tell you and really taking some time to spend some, we have the time now. COVID has given us that gift. We have the time. So use this time wisely, not to, find out the best way to make freaking brownies, but find out the best way that you can make maybe black bean brownies that are going to be healthy for you and your family that are absolutely phenomenal and delicious. So I will let her say, and then I have one more question for her. What, what did you want to add in there, Dr. Sarah? Well, you brought up a good point, and I just wanted to speak to that. Like, you know, I don't want, a lot of times I think patients, you know, they hear like, oh, I'm responsible, and then they start shaming and, you know, self-deprecating themselves. And that's not, you know, we've all done the best we can do with the knowledge we have. And so self-love and self-healing and forgiving yourselves and forgiving others, you know, be it your parents or teacher or whoever, um, you know, is part of the journey. And I think something that happens a lot in the healing space is like, I kind of call it like the new age 101 thing where everything is happy and everything is puppies and everything is roses. And, you know, I'm just going to be positive and I'm going to affirmate it away. And I'm all about, I love affirmations. I love positive thinking. I have used it in my life time and time again to manifest what I desire, but it's okay. Like this is me, you know, Dr. Still is giving you permission. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be jealous. It's okay to be envious. You know, we have all these emotions and if they are there, the best thing you can do is sit with them, journal to them, talk to them, breathe through them, experience them. A lot of times that's, they just need a, a voice. And when you give them that voice, they will just move through you and you will find harmony and peace. And if, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's good to be angry, you have a right to be angry. And so if the anger is hanging around or staying too long, then that's a good opportunity to kind of get some support around it. But, you know, we have the full catastrophe of emotions and we should experience them. So I don't want anyone to walk away with this feeling bad or berating themselves for having, you know, a negative emotion. And the other thing that I would say is, you know, the internet is a great place. I mean, you're getting to check us out now. And so we're happy you're here, but you know, it can also be a dangerous place. There's a lot of misinformation out of there and, you know, you know who you are. If you're one of those anxious people who gets like a pain right here, and then the next thing you know, you're on Dr. Google and you've diagnosed yourself with a brain tumor, maybe the internet is not the best place for you. So it's always good to find someone to work with who can support you and guide you. And it's not to say that you shouldn't utilize the internet, because I can tell you, I have learned a ton from my patients, you know, like bioidentical hormones is one of my specialties. And it's because one of my patients came in with a Suzanne Summers book and was like, I'm interested in this. And my first response was Chrissy from Three's Company. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but then I was like, all right, now I need to have an open mind. And, you right. know, so I took the book, I read it and I thought, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Let me put a better spin on it so we can make sure you're opening regulation and all of these things. But that's how I learned about it. And, you know, so we learn from each other. I've learned so much from my patients throughout the years. And so it's not to say, you know, so you should find a doctor who will work with you, but also that's a partner with you because yeah. like she said, you're with your body 24 seven, you know, your body best and you're going to have tendencies, things that you can talk to us about. But, and we're really good too, to help you figure out the forest from the trees and with the clinical experience, the education, the doctor and 
that uh, Dr. Stills has will allow her to look through blood work, look through other testing, and really come up with a plan and the program for you to turn that regulation around, to get your body to go in that healing mode, to allow the body internally to heal. And so I know, listen, this is new for a lot of people, this technology, our sponsor, Sound of Soul, and you're one of the few that has experienced it in Austria. So I'm going on a limb and asking you to please share with them because this podcast for me started because of our dear friend, Heidi, who passed in January, and she wanted us to make a wave out there in education with bioregulatory medicine and be able to really get it out there. And she knows that I never want to stop talking. So she said, go in front of the camera and start talking, would you? So I did. And as I put it together, I knew that this gift of Sound of Soul that I was fortunate enough to experience that same week that we're all in Germany together and bring to the United States has been such a gift for me personally in my journey, because I was the one that my husband will tell you, I worked really hard at being. <laughs> I worked really hard at being. I spent two hours a day in meditation and then I did my exercise and I made sure I journaled and I did, 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 did. And he was like, and when are you being? When are you just being? And I was really uncomfortable with myself in all honesty. I think that's really what it boiled down to. The quiet time, the still time. You know, Sharon Stills is good at being still. I wasn't good at being still. I had to learn that. That was a learned thing. But with Sound the Soul, it no longer became learned. It became visceral for me, what that was like to feel my own inner beauty. And it changed me. It changed my practice. It changed my relationships. It changed me because I saw me. And that's what being, you know, at first, I think when I started this journey years ago, I was angry. I was pissed. And it wasn't okay because I didn't have that permission that Dr. Sills just gave you all. I'm so thankful that she gave you all that because that is key to just meet yourself where you're at and then start climbing the ladder. By the time I did Sound the Soul, I was working at this for 22 years, for God's sakes. I was pretty close to the top. It just pushed me over the edge of blissful joy. But not everybody's going to have that experience. But what was your experience, if you would, with Sound the Soul? Well, you know, to listen to the music that your heart makes is something that I never thought I would actually get to do. I didn't even know that that was like a possibility. So it was pretty mind blowing to hear, you know, my own inner beauty and, you know, you have outer beauty and like you feel your inner beauty when you're doing something or being kind or volunteering or giving love, but to like actually hear it, how it manifests was pretty spectacular. So I'm, I don't have a machine yet, but I want to get one. <laughs> soon, soon, soon. <laughs> we're working through getting them through customs during COVID. It's been a little bit an issue, but we're working through it. But yeah, I appreciate that because that's, you know, we're all beautiful on the inside and we all have the capacity to heal on the inside and the filters that we have through our life screw us up sometimes. And, and whether that's filters of chemicals and metals or filters from emotional stuff and more than anything, what we want is we want you to feel your own inner beauty. We want you to know that you have that healing power in you. And truly from our heart to yours, that beat inside you is what heals. So breathe into it until you get your own sound of soul. Do some breath work. And if you don't know how to do that, or you're looking with chronic illness, or you want to know how to better take care of your children, you better want to know better how to handle your hormones, Dr. Stills is available to you. And in the show notes, you can find her access to her website. Do you want to tell us your website right now? Sure. Yeah. Drstills.com, which is pretty simple. And Dr. Sharon Stills, you know, on social media. Um, you know, BRMI is where I'll be podcasting through um, the science of self-healing. So I um, hope you'll check us out there. And um, yeah, it's just been great. I'd love to come back. We, we talk for days and days and days. <laughs> yes. yes, we could. And we have a lot of fun together when we do that. So thank you all for joining in. We know that you learned a lot today. Make sure you subscribe, hit the notification so you know when we're here. And thank you for joining us on The Beats. Mm -hmm.